All right. Um, will you guys turn in your Bibles or your phones or whatever you're using to act chapter four? My name's Tanner Van Beek. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm with Drake's Campus Ministry. I'm with Drake's Campus Ministry, and this is so cool to be up here. Um, I was saved through this ministry. Uh, I became a Christian my sophomore year at Drake, and so it's just, this is full circle for me. This is kind of an emotional experience, and so I'm really just, I'm very thankful to be able to share God's word with you guys. So for, that takes me back like to my first, I think about my first midweek, the first time that I showed up. Back then it was called Alive, and it was still on Drake's campus, and um, I, I don't think I was even a Christian the first time that I showed up, and so I showed up and I really didn't know uh, what was going to happen, what was going on, and so I'm just going to let you guys know um, what we're getting into tonight, what's going to happen. So first, I'm going to read the passage for us, then we're going to pray, then I'm going to share an opening illustration that is goofy, but also relevant, and then the text is going to give us a lesson in architecture, of all things. And so here I'm going to read Acts 4, 1 through 22. 1 through 22. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign had been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them now not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. This is God's word to us. Let's pray. Father God, we just we love you so much. We're so thankful for who you are and what you've done for us through your son Jesus and I just pray that tonight that Jesus is glorified and raised up by the preaching of your word and from the hearing of your word and God I just ask that you help us to see the world the way that you see it and that you help us to see ourselves the way that you see us we pray this in Jesus name amen all right so you guys would be uh, Pretty, pretty shocked at where looking for an opening illustration will take you. Um, so I was, I was hopping around the internet and I found 
um, this article on bold.com. Bold.com, I'd never heard of it before, but the article is called 10 Reasons You Should Never Make Him the Center of Your Life. Uh, talking about relationships, obviously. And so I'm going to read the 10 reasons you should never make him the center of your life. I didn't put them up on the slides, save, save the note-taking for something more substantial. Um, but here we go. Reason number one, you never know what will happen. Two, it's bad for the relationship. Three, it's bad for you. Four, it puts unnecessary pressure on him. Five, you'll never be satisfied. Six, you'll lose sight of who you are. Seven, if you two break up, you'll fall apart. Eight, he's only human, just like you. Nine, good relationships aren't rooted in codependency. And ten, the last one, you're the only person who can be the center of your life. Yeah. <laughs> You are the only person that can be the center of your life. And I don't know, maybe there's, maybe there's some nuggets of, of wisdom in here, and, and it's goofy, and obviously it's talking about, you know, worldly relationships. But, uh, you know, I'm here tonight. I'm, I'm going to be the anti-bold.com. I'm going to be the anti-bold.com uh, because I'm saying in, in regards to our lives and our faith, we need to be centered on one man. Unbelievers, they, they look past Jesus in regard to salvation, and believers, we can, we can forget him in our daily walk with God. And so I want to leave you guys here tonight with just one resolve, just one resolve, that all of your faith and all of your actions would be centered on one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Build your life on Jesus. And so this text that we're going through, it's going to show us how, why it's so important to um, build our lives on Jesus. And the apostles, um, this, this series we're going through through Acts is called How to Change the World, and the apostles changed the world because they built their lives on Jesus. But first, before, before our architecture lesson, I'm going to give some context about what we've been going through in the book of Acts. And so, we have uh, Peter and John, they, they healed this lame man. There was a lame man, his ankles and his feet were weak, he couldn't walk. And so every day he had people carry him to this gate where he would beg for money. And one day Peter and John, they came along and Peter healed this man in the name of Jesus and he could walk. And this drew in a huge crowd. Uh, everybody was amazed, obviously, at the healing and so this gave Peter and John the opportunity to, to preach the gospel to this big crowd. There's this group um, of Jewish priests and Sadducees, they're called. They're similar to the Pharisees. Uh, and it's this group who, they heard what Peter and John were preaching, and it says that they were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And so this group, the Sadducees, they had a lot of power and they, they didn't believe in a coming resurrection. They read the Old Testament and didn't believe that it taught that there was a resurrection coming. And not only that, but they didn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And so that's why they're greatly annoyed at the preaching of Peter and John because they're, they're preaching that Jesus did raise from the dead and that there's a coming resurrection and salvation is through the resurrected Jesus. So the priests and the Sadducees, they, they run out, they grab the temple guard, and they have Peter and John arrested and taken away. But as Peter and John are arrested and taken away, the text says that, but many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. So, so even as Peter and John, they're being dragged away, uh, we can see that the gospel was victorious. And that reminds us that, that when the gospel of Jesus is preached, it does go out victorious. The gospel goes out in victory. In Isaiah 55, verse 11, verses 10 and 11, it says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, 
giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And so the gospel of Jesus, when it goes out, it it doesn't return empty. It fulfills God's will. It accomplishes that which God purposes. And, And even as Peter and John, they're being dragged away, the people heard and they believed in Jesus and they were saved. And so Peter and John, they're taken away and, and held overnight. And then the next day, they're dropped in the middle of this, this big Jewish council. And this council, this is the highest Jewish authority in the land. They could decide the fate of their subjects. They could have people beaten, flogged, jailed, or they could even go to the Romans and, and, and have the Romans execute this person. And, and that's what they did to Jesus. They had Jesus killed this way. And so they're standing in the midst and they ask Peter and John, by what name did you do this? As if to say, like, who do you guys think that you are? And Peter, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He, he's given boldness and strength and um, Definitely some attitude because this, this response is gold in verses 8 through 12. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. And this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And so now here's where we get into our architecture lesson. And you, and you don't need to be uh, handy in any way to understand this. It, thank goodness for me, but um, it's, it's an easy one. It's an easy one. And so we start with the cornerstone. The cornerstone, Jesus Christ. First, what, what is a cornerstone? What is a cornerstone? I think I have some pictures um, back, back then when they were building these structures um, made, of, made of brick or, or whatever they used. The cornerstone was the foundational piece. It was the most important piece of the structure because when they were building the structure, the, the rest of the bricks were aligned by the cornerstone. And so that's how the structure took its shape by being aligned with the cornerstone. And it was so important that this tradition arose where when someone donates money for a building project, often the the biggest donor, their name will be put on the cornerstone as as this sign of honor, to honor them. And Peter, he, he calls back to a passage in the Old Testament because this group of, of Jewish priests, they would know the Old Testament very well and they would understand this reference in this passage. In Psalm 118, verse 22, that's the reference. It says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And so here we have Peter, he's calling back to that passage and he says, This man that you guys had killed, he is the cornerstone. He is the cornerstone. And it's like, what, what does Peter mean by that? Like, that seems to be like, like a weird connection that he's making. But when we, when we think about it, calling Jesus the cornerstone makes so much sense for so many reasons. Jesus, he's the most foundational, most important person. Everything else should be aligned by Jesus. His is the place of honor, the place of glory. And so Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the center of human history, and he's the center of God's plan for salvation. That's why he's the cornerstone. And so stretching back before creation, before the world was made, you had the triune God, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, They existed together in community, just like they do now. God doesn't change. He was the same back then, but... God had this plan. He had this plan to create the universe to display how glorious he is. And so he creates the world and he creates people. And Colossians 1 says that everything was created through Jesus and for Jesus. 
So everything, the world, people, we were created through Jesus, and we were created for Jesus. And human beings, we were, we were created, we were meant to live in God's presence and to worship and to honor him. But humans, we, they turned away from God. They turned away from God to follow their own selfish desires, and they rebelled against God. They sinned. They fell into sin, and all sin is is, is rebellion, simply put. And because Adam fell into sin, Adam was the first man, he was the representative of mankind. When he fell into sin, that affected the rest of humanity to follow. Because he fell into sin, every person since then is born with this sin nature. We're born with sinful hearts. Every, every part of us is tainted by sin. It affected all of mankind, and all of mankind fell into sin. And that's tragic because God, God loves his creation and his creation was good and, and God is perfectly good and he loves everything that's good. But, but since God is perfectly good, evil can't be in his presence. Evil can't be in his presence. It's like water and oil. They just, they don't mix. And so he casts Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. He casts them out of his presence and God brings a curse upon the world. Death is introduced into the world, and humans are, are left in their sin. And God says that there will come a day when he will judge humanity for their rebellion and bring justice and bring the punishment that is deserved. But in God's grace and in God's mercy, he made a promise before he brought the curse. He made a promise. He promised to Satan who tempted Eve to sin, that the woman will bring forth offspring that will crush Satan's head. It will crush Satan's head and will defeat Satan and, and reconcile the world back to himself, reversing the effects of that curse. And so God, he, he's talking about somewhere down the line, there will be a man, and that man will defeat Satan, and that man will reconcile the world to himself, and that man is the Lord Jesus. And the rest of the Old Testament goes on to point towards Jesus Christ. There's so many prophecies of a coming Messiah that will come and deliver the people. There's prophecies that the Messiah will be born of a virgin. Prophecies that the Messiah will be born in a small town called Bethlehem. Prophecies that the Messiah will, will suffer for the sins of his people. And Jesus Christ came and fulfills all of those prophecies perfectly. He fulfills them perfectly. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 says this, For all the promises of God are yes in him. They're yes in Jesus Christ. And not only the, the promises of the offspring, the offspring that comes to defeat Satan, the promise that the Messiah will come and deliver the people, the promise that a king will come and sit on the throne and rule and reign, all of those are yes in Jesus Christ. He fulfills all of them perfectly. And not only does Jesus fulfill all of the promises of God, all of history points towards Jesus. All of history points towards him. You have Adam, the first man, the representative of mankind. He disobeys. He falls into sin. He brings death into the world by his actions. And you have Jesus Christ, the perfect representative for humankind who obeys and brings life. You have Moses, the prophet who, who led his people out of Egypt, out of slavery. And you have Jesus Christ who leads his people, us, out of slavery, of sin and death. You have David who was made king over Israel to rule and reign. And you have Jesus, the, the perfect king who sits on his throne and rules and reigns perfectly. You have the prophets who, who were given the word of God to speak to the people. And you have Jesus Christ who is the very truth of God, who is the truth of God that perfectly communicates God's word to the people. So all of God's promises are yes in Jesus and all of history 
points toward the Lord Jesus. And so let me ask you this question. Is this Jesus worthy of building your life on? Out of the hardness of their hearts, the Jews, they they overlooked Jesus as the coming Messiah. They overlooked him, and they had him beaten. They had him mocked. They had him hung up on the cross and had him killed and crucified with criminals. They overlooked Jesus as Savior. And friends, we, we need a Savior. We need to be saved. In humanity's fallen state, we are all sinners. We've rebelled against God. Rebellion is what is most natural to us. And, and God, he's holy. He's perfectly good. He's set apart from us. He is not like us. And so only a perfect person can stand to be in God's presence. And, and we are not that. We are not perfect. We have stolen. We have lied. We have gone against our conscience. We have thought bad thoughts. We have been selfish. And Jesus gave us, he gave us the greatest commandments, the, the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and the second to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and we have fallen so short of both of those things. We don't love God above everything else. We constantly prioritize things above God. And we don't love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We love ourselves far too much for that. Sometimes we joke Sometimes we joke about how much we hate ourselves. You know, maybe you've heard the joke. um, If you could hit a a button and you got 50 bucks, but your worst enemy got 50 bucks too, would you hit the button? And and the joke response is, yeah, of course I'd hit the button. Like, then I would have 150 bucks because I'm my biggest enemy. I I hate myself. But, But we don't hate ourselves. We love ourselves far too much. We are selfish. And our sin makes us dirty. We're dirty. Our sin stains us. And we we can't be in the presence of God because of our sin. It doesn't mix. In fact, our rebellion needs to be punished. It it deserves punishment. If I I am in grade school and I I rebel against my teacher, I, I probably get detention because I deserve it. And if, I, if I'm growing up and I rebelled against my dad, I, I would probably get grounded or something because I deserved it. So what do I deserve when I rebel against my creator, my holy and, and almighty God? And it, it deserves eternal separation from everything good, every blessing that God gives us. I deserve to be in hell I, I deserve to taste the full wrath of God. And we need to understand the width and the depth of our own sin so that we can understand what grace is. We need to understand this so we can understand what grace is. And God is righteous, he's perfectly righteous, and he needs to punish injustice. We would... We would hate God. We would think God is a monster if he left injustice go unpunished. But, but another way that God shows just how glorious he is is to show that he is loving and to show that he is merciful. And so we come to the good news, the gospel of Jesus, to show how loving and merciful he is. God made a way so that he could both deliver perfect justice, and save sinners. And that way is a substitute. A substitute. That's probably one of the most important words that you will ever hear. A substitute. Someone who could step into our place of guilt and take our punishment so that we might take their place of innocence. And that substitute, guys, is the cornerstone It's the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And that name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's that's an exclusive claim. That's an exclusive claim. And for Christians, this is a hill 
that we need to die on because there's no other way to be saved but through faith in the Lord Jesus. He himself says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that the, the path to heaven is narrow, is a narrow gate, and there's no salvation through anything else but through the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why. So Jesus, he was sent down to us. He was sent down to earth, and he was God in the flesh. He was God in the flesh. He was the Son of God and the Son of Man. He was perfectly God and perfectly man. And he knew no sin. Jesus never sinned. He never had a bad thought. He was never selfish. He never had uh, a selfish action. He was without sin. He was pure. He was the spotless Lamb of God. Perfection. No one else has ever been perfect. But God in the flesh, only he could be the perfect substitute that we need because our infinite debt can only be paid by an infinite person. And so Jesus, he went to the cross where God's full wrath for our rebellion was poured out onto Jesus. And he was nailed up. He was nailed up. And the transaction that occurred there was that the sinner's seed of guilt and shame and punishment was exchanged for the sinless seat of innocence and purity and righteousness. And Jesus was up on the cross and he cried, it is finished, it is finished. Redemption had been purchased by his blood and he took his last breath and he died for our rebellion. And one of the Roman guards that stood near the cross looked at the dead body of the Lord Jesus and he said, surely this man was the Son of God. And then in his divine power of his spirit, he came back to life, proving that he had won victory over even death. Death could not hold the Son of God. He rose again, not in a, not in a spiritual, ghostly form, but, but in his glorified, human, air-breathing, blood-pumping body. He spent 40 days teaching his disciples, and then, then he ascended into heaven and took his rightful seat at the right hand of the Father. And this seat is the seat of highest honor. It is the seat of, of all authority, all power, all of which rightly belong to him. And he sits there now. He sits there now in heaven, very alive. He's very alive. And that's where he sits. But yet his selfless service toward his people has not stopped. It hasn't stopped. See, at the right hand of the Father, the Lord Jesus, he now mediates for us. He's constantly applying to us the redemption that he bought with his blood. It is there he's now praying for us. He's praying for us. He's praying that we would be protected from the dark spiritual forces that are set against us, that we would grow in our godliness and in our unity, that our faith would endure until the end when we die. And then, and then that's when we will be taken up to the Lord Jesus and we will see him face to face finally and we will be made like him and that work that was started in us here on earth when God brought us to believe in his son it will be finished there it will be completed and our bodies will be glorified and all of our sin will be forever gone and we will never again struggle with it and nothing will ever hold us back from loving and worshiping our great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, with all of our redeemed heart. It's this Jesus, it's this Jesus who Acts says is the author of life. It's this Jesus who holds redemption in his hand. He will come back and judge the world, and anyone who hasn't trusted in him will taste the full wrath of God. Jesus will carry out God's justice, but, but don't forget that Jesus loves to save sinners. He loves to save sinners. 
Saving sinners is at his very heart. That's who he is. He will never turn away a sinner that comes to him. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you tired tonight? Are you carrying a heavy burden? Are you full of guilt and shame for the way that you've been living? Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He doesn't say, come to me, you who have it all together. He doesn't say, clean up your life first and then come to me. He, he hasn't come for the righteous. He's come for the unrighteous. He hasn't come for, for the healthy. He's come for the unhealthy, the sick. And he hasn't come for the, the clean, spotless people, but he's come for messy people. And guys, I've banked on that promise so many times. He doesn't even say, throw off your burdens. Take the time to throw off your burdens and then come to me. He just says, come to me now. You can come to Jesus just the way you are, mess and all, because he came to save sinners just like you and just like me. I need forgiveness. You need forgiveness. We all need God's forgiveness. And the Lord Jesus, at this very moment, offers that forgiveness full and free. If you don't know Jesus in this way, will you go to him? Will you go to him? Will you recognize his authority Will you recognize his power to save you? Will you go to him and and tell him, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I am a sinner and I need to be saved. I, I can't do this myself. Will you save me? And I promise to you on, on the authority of God's word that if you come to him, he will not cast you out. He will not cast you out. He will receive you. He will save you. He will take your guilt. He will take your shame. He will cleanse you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. He will give you his righteousness. He will give you a relationship with God. You will be adopted into God's family as a son, as a daughter. You will be given an inheritance that will not pass away. And you will share in the glory of the Lord Jesus forever. So will you come to him? Will you come to him? And guys, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, full of mercy, full of grace, and this is the cornerstone. He is the cornerstone. Is this Jesus worthy of building your life on? So we've looked at Jesus being the cornerstone. Now let's look at at the the rest of the building, the rest of the structure, and finish up our our lesson in architecture. When I was 16, um, I I was saving up a bunch of money to buy a motorcycle, Um, and I I started to work for a family friend, and he he built brick walls and and, and structures, and and so I started to work for him. And and so on my first day on the job, uh, my very first task was to fill up this big wheelbarrow full of like the, the mortar, the mortar that you lay the bricks with. And so, so you have me, 16-year-old, like overconfident, cross-country, rail-thin tanner. And uh, so I, I, I fill it all up and, and I, I grab the wheelbarrow and lift it up and then just take my first step and just immediately, it's, it's it everywhere. The mortar's everywhere. It's all mixed into like gravel and grass. Um, and yeah, needless to say, like I wasn't asked back to that job ever again, <laughs> um, but guys, I was a, I was a smart mouth 16 year old and I wish that I hadn't have done this. Um, but as the mortar is mixed into all of this and I'm standing there, uh, my boss comes over and, and I, I say this, I say, can't we just build the wall here? And guys, in, in regard to our life, 
we can't just build wherever we want. We can't just build wherever we want. We need to build on the cornerstone. And so this text gives us two examples. The, the first example, the Jews, they did not build their life on the cornerstone. And the second example, the apostles who did, they did. So first we'll look at the Jews. They had not built their life on the cornerstone. In Judaism, it's, it's this big structure, it's this big building, and the Jews, they, they followed the laws that God had given to them through Moses, you know, the, the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments and the included laws. And those laws were meant to, to set them apart, to set them apart as a people of God so that the other nations could look at Israel and see that they were the God of Israel's people. God is holy and he's set apart and he wanted to, to have a depiction of that by his people. And he also gave the law to point them to their need for a savior because they, they couldn't follow all of these laws within themselves. And so he gave them the law so that they would be prepared for the coming Messiah. But the Jews, they, they took all these laws and they just, they ran with it. They ran with it. They self-righteously followed those laws as if they were earning credit, as if they were building their way up to a relationship with God. And they even added additional laws that God didn't command just to make themselves look even better. And salvation is by God's grace through faith in Jesus. It, it always has been and it always will be. And so the economy of God, it, it, it doesn't look like, like we earn our salvation. We work our way to God. We work our way to heaven. That's not what God's economy looks like. And yet, uh, the Jews, they were content to, to keep trying to work their way. And so here we have John and Peter. They're preaching the gospel. They're preaching that salvation is, is only through faith in Christ. And so the Jews, they had them persecuted and arrested. And we see something similar today, Christless Christianity. Christless Christianity. And it's so, it's so easy for us to do the exact same thing, to make the same mistake, to fall into the same trap that the Jews did. We can overlook Jesus. We can go, we can read our Bible every day, we can go to church every week, we can be involved in a youth group or campus ministry, but we can be doing all of those things without Jesus. We can be doing all of those things to somehow work our way up to God, to clean ourselves up, to convince God that, that I'm a good person and I deserve to, to be let in to heaven when I die. There's no relationship with the Lord Jesus in Christless Christianity. There's no, no recognizing that I'm guilty before God, that I'm sinful and don't deserve heaven. There's no repentance and turning away from my sin. There's no faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. Christless Christianity is no Christianity at all. It's no Christianity at all. It lacks power, it lacks truth, it lacks forgiveness, and it lacks grace because all of those things are exclusively found in the Lord Jesus. So friends, do not center your life, do not build your life on Christless Christianity. Instead, follow the example of Peter and John who did build their lives on the cornerstone. The apostles built their lives on the cornerstone. Their, their actions actually reflected what they believed. Their, their money was, was where their mouths were. They, we find them here in this passage boldly preaching the gospel, preaching that Jesus was the Son of God, that he died, that he was resurrected, that he's in heaven, that salvation is only found through him. And they're preaching that in a place where it was dangerous. They were willing to be beaten. They were willing to be flogged. They were willing to be imprisoned. They were willing to die for this gospel. In verses 18, 18 through 20, they say this, So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. 
But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So why are they like this? Why are they so bold? Verse 13 gives us the answer. It says, Now when they, the Jews, saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. That's the answer. They had been with Jesus. Jesus had taught them. They had seen Jesus crucified on the cross. They, they had seen the resurrected Jesus. They, they saw him ascend into heaven. And so Jesus, he, he was their reality. Jesus was so real to them. They couldn't help but live in any other way but to completely sell out for the Lord Jesus. And my biggest hope for you is that Jesus would be so real to you, that Jesus would be so real to you, that, that in your mind and in your heart, the Lord Jesus, he wouldn't be a long time ago or, or an abstract idea or ghostly or dead because he's, he's none of those things. He's none of those things. The truth is that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all, now and forever, whether, whether we recognize it or not, he's the Lord of all. He suffered for sins. He died for sinners. He rose from the dead, having defeated sin and death. He, he ascended into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father, and he, he's very alive. He's very alive. And now he commands all authority and all power, and he's holding salvation in his hand for all who would come to him. And he's carrying out God's plan to reconcile the world back to himself. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and this is our reality. This is our reality. And this is our cornerstone. This is our cornerstone. And so to wrap up tonight, I don't have any points of application or anything because I just want to leave you guys just with, with one thing and one thing only. Is this Jesus worthy of building your life on? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus and for sending a substitute that you could be just, but you could also show your mercy and your grace. Thank you that Jesus can take our sins and take our place and give us a relationship with you, God. We love you so much for that, and we just pray that the Lord Jesus is so very real and alive to us because he is. He is the Lord of all, and we praise him, and we pray this in his name. Amen.